the, the next panel that we have, um, we're really, really thrilled. We have um, a panel called Location Tracking by the Government after Jones. What is Jones, the Supreme Court decision? Tell us about mobile app and app tracking. Um, and we're very, very pleased uh, that we have a great lineup of folks to kind of hack through this for the next half hour. Um, yes, uh, the other day, I think four days ago, uh, the Congressional Research Service released their um, report on the United States First Jones GPS monitoring, property, and privacy. So it's a good read uh, by the Congressional Research Service. So um, I direct your attention to that. But so today, um, uh, Sharon Franklin from the Constitution Project uh, attorney has has agreed to moderate our discussion, and I'll, I'll hand it over to her. Thanks, Sharon. Thank you. Um, and I, I'm Sharon Bradford Franklin, uh, Senior Counsel with the Constitution Project. And uh, I'm joined here, as you know, by Greg Nojime, a Senior Counsel with Center for Democracy and Technology, and Jason Weinstein, who is Assistant Attorney General mm -hmm. for the Criminal Division of the Department of Justice. So I just want to set the stage briefly for our conversation, which comes off a Supreme Court decision you're probably aware of, the GPS tracking case, or United States versus Jones. And I don't want to get into too much legalese here, but just give you a little bit of the background uh, for our conversation. So this is a case in which the court began to grapple with the issue of how does the Fourth Amendment apply in the digital age? And do modern technology and the very powerful surveillance tools we have available today uh, change the analysis in any way? And how do we continue to draw appropriate lines so that law enforcement can do its appropriate work, but we still protect constitutional safeguards? So in this case, Mr. Jones argued that a valid search warrant should be required before the police could install a GPS tracking device on his car and track him continuously. And the court unanimously agreed that if the police install a GPS tracking device on an individual's property and use that device continuously, in this period it was for a period of about four weeks, 24-7, that this constitutes a search under the Fourth Amendment. But the court issued three separate opinions to get to that result. And I just want to give you a very brief encapsulation of the differences. The majority opinion by Justice Scalia focused on a more traditional trespass analysis and the fact that the police had interfered with Mr. Jones's property rights when they actually physically stuck the device on his car. And that, they said, constituted a search under the Fourth Amendment. We also had an opinion, the main concurrence, authored by Justice Alito, and joined by three other justices, which focused on the court's more traditional privacy analysis, something called the reasonable expectation of privacy test. And they said, when you're looking at this very powerful electronic surveillance, this is something new and different. And even though we're only talking about in a public place, this violates a reasonable expectation of privacy. And it didn't matter whether the police actually physically installed the device or not. The final opinion was by Justice Sotomayor. She actually joined the majority's analysis on the physical intrusion analysis, but wrote separately, also echoing the concerns under the reasonable expectation of privacy test, and highlighting something which none of the other justices addressed, which is something uh, called the third party doctrine, which is just worth flagging for you, even though we can't go into too much detail on that today. And that's a doctrine coming from a 1976 case that says, when you voluntarily turn over your information to a third party, like a bank, or perhaps looking for a cell phone provider, you lose your privacy interest in that. And so the government can get your information directly from that third party without having to get a traditional warrant. And Justice Sotomayor said, you know, in today's world, particularly today's digital world, where so much of our um, interactions in life requires that kind of disclosure, maybe we need to rethink that doctrine. So that's the stage of the Jones case. And I'm, we're going to uh, skip over opening, not do opening statements here, but just move right into a series of questions trying to say what does this case mo mean moving forward. So first, I want to turn to uh, Jason and um, ask you this. So some legal commentators have focused on the fact that in the majority opinion, they didn't actually say a warrant is required for this uh, kind of transaction. They said, this constitutes a search under the Fourth Amendment. And some commentators have said, well, maybe there's an exception you know, to the warrant requirement. It's not necessarily clear that that's the implication from Jones. So I would ask you to please describe, what is the Department of Justice's policy here? We know from the FBI General Counsel that, in fact, about 3,000 GPS devices were turned off in the aftermath of Jones. Um, but if you could tell us what the policy is and whether it matters if law enforcement installs the device itself. 
Sure. Um, you know, just to put Jones in a bit of perspective, there are some people who, in, in the wake of the opinion, have, de have uh, declared it to be the watershed of, of technology and privacy law and, har and a harbinger of major changes in the law to come, and, and others have viewed it as a more limited opinion. And certainly the legal basis for the holding of the, of the majority opinion is, is somewhat limited, as Sharon just alluded to. Um, it's also worth uh, putting in perspective that the decision simply highlighted the need for a search warrant in situations where it wasn't entirely clear before that one was necessary. Um, and consistent with that decision, our prosecutors are now being advised uh, nationwide to get a search warrant in any case in which they're going to put a tracker on a car, unless there is some documented exception to the warrant requirement that might apply. Um, it's worth noting, by the way, for those not familiar with the facts of Jones, that in that case, the, the officers did in fact get a warrant. It turned out not to be a valid warrant for some technical reasons. They executed it 11 days after it was issued as opposed to 10 days. They executed it in Maryland, even though the warrant was issued in D.C. But these guys weren't cowboys. They, they actually did try to take the step of getting a warrant. It just happened not to be a technically valid one. And it, in my experience, certainly what I uh, would taught prosecutors in my career as an AUSA, uh, and what I would always do in, in my own cases, even pre-Jones, is to get a court order based on probable cause to use a tracker, even if it's the type that was used in the Jones case. That is one that is slapped onto the car and not uh, physically installed into the vehicle. And, and the simple reason for that is because, not because we all knew at that time that, you know, 20 years later the court was going to say that that's a trespass, but because it makes it possible for you to monitor the signals coming from that tracker in a private space. Uh, if you, the premise of not needing a warrant and the pre-Jones era was that it's not a, a Fourth Amendment event to put the tracker on. And as long as you only monitor the, the car when it's on public roads, Fourth Amendment interests aren't implicated. But oftentimes, criminals choose to do their criminal activity not on public roads. Uh, you know, if you, in a simple matter, if you have a drug case in which a drug dealer pulls the car into a garage to meet a colleague or a co-conspirator, and then they do the exchange of the drugs or the money in a private garage, um, there's some litigation risk if you, if you don't have a warrant and you're monitoring the signals in what is arguably a private space. So. Um, in my view, the best practice, even pre-Jones, was to get a tracker, um, and I think now the best practice has just now become the required practice. Thank you. So I want to ask Greg in turn. Um, the, we've been talking now about Jones, which is exclusively a constitutional holding. Of course, when you're looking at location tracking and what is legal, we also have some statutes in play, including uh, Electronic Communications Privacy Act, or ECPA. And there's been a lot of litigation going on before Jones and since Jones, and we have some differences in the courts. So I want to see if Greg can uh, lay the stage for you a little bit of what, what is the current state of play in the courts on whether and when uh, a warrant is required to get cell phone location tracking information, which is a little bit different than the necessarily the physical GPS tracker. So Jones um, was uh, a watershed opinion. And um, the reason it's, it's particularly important is because in that case, there were about 3,000 GPS devices in active use placed by federal law enforcement. But today, there are about 323 million of these tracking devices held by people. And uh, the big elephant in the room for Jones was what about cell phone location data? And uh, so far the courts have not been consistent in deciding what should be the standard for cell phone location data. Um, some courts have said, well, if it's real time, maybe you need a warrant. Um, and some courts haven't said that. And others have said, uh, no, no, uh, uh, for stored, um, you, you uh, don't need a warrant, but um, some courts have now said that magistrates can require warrants. Uh, the Third Circuit um, reached that decision, and that question about stored location uh, for cell tower is now in front of the Fifth Circuit as well. Um, and then there's the issue about what, it, what is the nature of the location information being sought? Is it GPS data, or is it cell tower data? GPS data has traditionally been thought to be more precise than cell tower data. But that uh, distinction, I think, is being called into question today. Because as more and more of us get more and more of these location-aware devices, the cell sectors are shrinking. Some cell sectors cover just um, a, a floor of a building, and some cell sectors cover just a room. So, you know, this guy, he's not going to, his GPS is not going to work inside this building. But if there's a cell sector inside this room, all of a sudden I'm located much more precisely with this cell 
tower location information than I am with GPS. So the way the uh, technology is moving suggests that location will be more and more precisely available through this cell site um, sector method of determining location as compared to GPS. Okay, so we know that we have the Constitution in play and Jones' decision on the Fourth Amendment, and we have um, the uh, statutory law, which is in some flux in the interpretation coming from the courts. So the question is obviously an open one of what is the standard now for um, law enforcement access to cell phone location information. So Jason, do you believe that Congress has any role here, should be acting here, do we need, for law enforcement purposes, some greater clarity on what the standards should be? Um, the short answer is, is yes, but I won't stick to the short answer. Um, so although, I, as I said before, people can disagree about the, the magnitude of the, um, or the impact of Jones, I think everybody can agree, if you read the opinion, that the Supreme Court has essentially placed the ball in Congress's court. Uh, Justice Alito said in his opinion that a legislative body is best situated to draw detailed lines and balance privacy and public safety in a comprehensive way. And I think that's right. And in fact, that reflects the way our system is supposed to work. Congress sets the rules of the road for law enforcement. Prosecutors have to follow those rules. And judges make sure that those rules are being followed properly. And where those rules need to be clarified, as was the case in Jones, they clarify them. And that system of checks and balances, I think, is a critical component to protecting all of our privacy. The reason why I say my short answer is yes, and that there's a need for some congressional action in the area of cell phone location information is because courts have come out in different ways um, with respect to cell tower information. And let me, let me if, I, if I may, just sort of break down what, the, what our view is of the legal standard that applies to three different types of cell phone location information. First, there's cell tower information. Mark Eckenweiler from the Office of Enforcement Operations in here, and he, and he knows more about cell tower information than, than anyone I've ever met. And in fact, argued the Third Circuit case that Greg just mentioned. So I will not do justice to the explanation that he could give. But as I think most of you know, to connect a call or to complete the, the transmission of a text message during the actual operation of the call or during the sending of the message, the network of your provider has to be able to identify the cell tower and sometimes the 120 degree pie slice sector of that tower that is closest to you or closest to the person to whom you're, you're communicating and needs that information just for the operation of the network to be able to complete the transmission. And providers create and maintain those records in the ordinary course of their business. It's a necessary aspect of providing wireless service. To use the language of the third party doctrine in Miller and Smith, uh, th those records are not private papers. They are, uh, they are records of a transaction in which the provider is a participant. They're business records of the provider. And the provider has to create and maintain those records. They're not created at the direction of law enforcement. They are um, not nearly as precise as GPS, even in an urban environment. Uh, they reveal only the physical location of the cell tower that's serving the call. In some cases, because of network traffic, it might not actually be the cell tower that is closest to you. Um, depending on call volume, I'm sorry, depending on cell tower density, it could be miles and miles, uh, the range of the tower. It could be, you know, a, a few hundred yards in, in the most dense urban area. Um, and and it's, it's far less precise. And within the range of cell tower information, there's two types. There's historical, that is, you know, what cell tower your call was hitting off 60 days ago when you made a phone call and perspective you know, over the course of the next 30 days, what cell towers will your, will your phone be hitting off of when you make calls. Um, generally speaking, although there is some disagreement, and as, as Greg noted, the Third Circuit um, issued an opinion, which you'll be stunned to hear that the department disagrees with, um, in which it said that even if the, if the, the sta statutory standard is met, the court can require a, a higher standard. But generally speaking, the standard for historical cell tower information is what we call specific and articulable facts. Um, sort of best understood and more easily um, pronounced as reasonable suspicion. Um, for prospective cell tower, there is a significant split that's developed among the, the, the courts throughout the country, in some cases within the same courthouse and in some cases within the same circuit, uh, courthouses within the same circuit, as to whether the standard should be specific and articulable facts or whether a search warrant should be required based on probable cause. Uh, I, I practiced most recently as an AUSA in a district that in 2005 switched from being a reasonable suspicion to a probable cause uh, district. And I can explain the implications of that later. Um, but putting cell tower information aside, uh, you know, so you've got reasonable suspicion for historical. Um, you've got, in some courts, reasonable suspicion in some specific and articulable facts. In some courts, probable cause for prospective cell tower. And then there comes GPS, which we'll broadly call GPS, but with the understanding that it's not always GPS technology, but what you might understand is precision location information. Um, our practice and what we uh, tell our prosecutors throughout the country is to get a search warrant. 
that may be a surprise to some of you, uh, given some of the rhetoric about Jones and its implications, but let's, so let me say it again. When we seek to use uh, your cell phone to get GPS or precise location information, we get a search warrant. We do that for a number of reasons, including the fact that, that the, the records, the GPS records, unlike cell tower records, are not records that the provider generally is creating in the course of its own business. These are records that are being created generally at the request of law enforcement, and they usually require the provider to do something active with the phone itself to make the phone send that information to the provider. The other reason uh, is that it, there is a great likelihood that if you're tracking someone's phone using uh, GPS or other technology in their phone itself, is that you will be tracking their movements in a private space. Um, so there are constitutional implications to that. So for that reason, or for those reasons and others, we have, as long as I can remember, and I've been doing this since the late 90s, as long as I can remember, the department's position has been that when you're using precise location information to track a phone, you get a search warrant. The, those conflicting interpretations uh, as to cell tower information are really what has created a lot of uncertainty. And there really is no fairness and no justice when the law applies differently to different people depending on what courthouse you're sitting in or you're standing in as a defendant. And so for that reason alone, we think that Congress should clarify the legal standard for historical and prospective cell tower information. And, and as I, you can probably tell from my remarks, I think that the standard the, court, the, the, the Congress should, should come to is a consistent, specific, and articulable fact standard. Thank you. So uh, we have actually consensus among the three of us up here that there is a role for Congress. Um, uh, Greg's organization, the Center for Democracy and Technology, is heading up a coalition called the Digital Due Process Coalition. And uh, my organization, the Constitution Project, is a member. It includes a broad coalition of uh, business groups, high tech companies, as well as privacy advocacy groups seeking um, some legislation here. And so I want to ask Greg to describe for you all, as far as location tracking, what the uh, goals of uh, DDP are, as well as there are some bills already pending in Congress that uh, would address some of these issues and what the state of play is there. So one of the um, principles that um, we agreed in in digital due process early on was uh, the principle of tech neutrality, that it shouldn't matter whether location is being determined by, for example, cell tower location or by um, GPS. And when you look down the road at where um, cell tower location information is going, it's becoming more and more precise. And uh, I commend to you some testimony house side by Matt Blaze, uh, a professor at UPenn um, in June, on June 24, 2010. He really lays it out. He explains how cell, cell site location information is becoming um, as precise and may become even more precise than GPS. Uh, and I mentioned um, some of those factors earlier. Um, our group, Digital Due Process, includes a lot of the companies that you know well, uh, Adobe, Amazon, Apple, AT&T, eBay, Facebook, Google, Intel, Microsoft, Quest, uh, and a lot of the civil liberties and privacy groups um, that you know well, and they expand the political spectrum uh, also, you've got ACLU and Americans for Tax Reform, um, um, CDT and EFF and uh, a, a lot of the other um, privacy groups. And we all settled on um, uh, uh, four recommendations. One of them is that uh, a government entity should be able to access or require another entity to provide prospectively or retrospectively location information regarding a mobile communications device only with a warrant based on a showing of probable cause. So for both prospective and retrospective location, we said there should be a warrant. For GPS and cell tower, we said there should be a warrant. Um, and there are two pieces of legislation that have been introduced on location. Um, one is the GPS Act, Senate side S1212, Wyden is the leader. Um, and it would require warrants for both stored and uh, prospective location. House side uh, counterpart, Chaffetz is the leader, H.R. 2168. And then Senator Leahy has the ECPA Amendments Act, S1011. And the Leahy bill would require a warrant for real time and specific and articulable facts for stored. Thank you. So, uh, Jason, I don't think you're in a position to give an official DOJ a position on this legislation, but you have alluded to your belief that 
if Congress should act, it should, um, for cell phone location information, impose a, a lower standard than what the court has said is required for the GPS tracking when we're talking about a GPS device. Uh, could you explain why you believe the lower standard is appropriate in the c case of the cell phone information? Sure. Um, and and I, I can't comment on a particular piece of legislation, but I, I, I can articulate some general principles. But I would say that that um, the department appreciates greatly the efforts of Senator Leahy and Senator Wyden and Congressman Chaffetz and others to take up these difficult issues. This is a difficult space to legislate in, and as the public outcry in the wake of uh, the Protect IP Act and the Stop Online Piracy Act indicate it's a treacherous territory for, for legislators, and, and I admire them for, for trying to engage on these issues, and we look forward to working with them um, with the goal of making sure that any legislation that is designed to enhance privacy truly does enhance privacy, but without compromising public safety. Um, let me explain why I think that, that a warrant, a uniform warrant standard for all types of location information without regard to its precision or, or, or the way it's generated uh, uh, and maintained is, is a mistake. Um, probable cause is a standard that we follow uh, uh, historically in American law enforcement for our most intrusive techniques, search warrants in your home, wiretaps, now GPS information on your cell phone. But it's important to keep in mind that we don't start our investigations with probable cause. We build up to probable cause using less intrusive techniques. We have to use uh, these less intrusive techniques as building blocks, if you will, to, to develop enough evidence to, to overcome a, a probable cause standard. Cell tower information is a very important one of those building blocks. It's used routinely in the early stages of criminal investigations and national security terrorism investigations when the government just doesn't have probable cause for a warrant uh, to try to develop enough evidence to, to get over that hurdle. And the failure to distinguish between different types of location information and to require probable cause for all types would cripple and, and I don't use that term lightly, would cripple many law enforcement and national security investigations before they can really uh, reach their goal. And would make it substantially harder to get this information uh, in and, and to solve crimes. And in some cases, it would make it just impossible. As I mentioned before, I practiced as an AUSA in a district that almost overnight went from being a specific and articulable facts district for prospective cell tower information to a warrant district. And, and our ability to get prospective cell tower information to solve violent crimes. I was the chief of the violent crime section, so most of my time was spent solving murders and, and gang-related crimes for which cell tower information was, was uh, as, as critical as, as guns and bullets into solving these crimes. And we lost, uh, essentially lost the ability to use prospective cell tower information to solve those cases, and it in fact made it impossible to solve many of them. Um, this has very real consequences. We talk about this as if it's just electronic crimes and data. But the consequences are real in a very human way. Um, cell tower information is used to, uh, to, uh, to find missing children, to solve abductions, to um, catch child pornographers, to catch murderers. And, and you know, we refer to specific and articulable facts as a lower standard than probable cause, and to be sure that it, it is. But it is not a low standard. That is a meaningful standard that provides a substantial degree of privacy protection. In fact, back in 1994, when Congress raised the standard for uh, historical cell tower records from just a subpoena to this n current standard of specific and articulable facts, it was embraced by the privacy community, by privacy groups, as protective of privacy. And in fact, one leading privacy advocate hailed that new standard as a significant privacy advance and said that that new standard would confer a high degree of protection that would prevent fishing expeditions. The person who said that was Jerry Berman, who's the founder of this caucus and, and at the time was the executive director of EFF. And although I don't find myself often in the position of agreeing with EFF, he was exactly right. Uh, it is a high standard. It is a meaningful standard. And anyone who thinks it's a rubber stamp, I would submit, has never actually tried to get a D order signed in the District of Maryland. Okay. Can, can I give sure. – we want to allow at least a little bit of time for questions. Sure. I just want to give Greg a quick opportunity to respond on why the probable cause standard is not critically hampering law enforcement and is appropriate. And then I want to have time for a couple questions from the audience. Exactly. The same argument was made in Jones. Exactly. It will cripple law enforcement. It will, the criminals will run roughshod over law-abiding people. And Jones came out the other way. Not one justice accepted the Department of Justice's argument in that case. It got zero votes. Um, the court reached its decision. And guess what? We're all here. The criminals are not uh, taking over the country and uh, things are going to work out okay. Listen, um, any time Congress legislates in this area, it has to be very careful. One good thing about Congress stepping in, as opposed to relying on the courts to make these constitutional decisions, is that Congress can look carefully at where exceptions might need to be made to a strong probable cause standard. 
Um, one exception would need to be made for emergencies. That's already in the Wiretap Act. It's already in ECPA. We would expect it would be uh, available for uh, um, location information as well. Another would be child kidnapping cases. Um, you want the parents to be able to consent if their child is abducted and the child is regarded as the uh, uh, owner or operator or controller of the cell phone. So I think that it's important to remember that probable cause is not a straitjacket. It can be applied in ways that can uh, both facilitate law enforcement investigations and protect privacy. And it's up to Congress to really uh, make that happen. Okay, I think we have time for at least a couple of questions. I want to ask you, though, to please identify yourself and please actually ask a question, especially since our time is short. Okay, right here. Um, let me take the first crack, and I'm sure Greg can add stuff in. Um, let me, there, to answer your question, there's a couple of myths about law enforcement and privacy that I think have to be addressed. Um, when law enforcement is seeking access to your electronic communications, I, I say to your, to people's electronic com communications, it is for the purpose of solving crimes. It's for the purpose of catching criminals. The average citizen doesn't have their accounts accessed by law enforcement. In fact, you know, Google collects information about law enforcement requests that it gets uh, every six months. And in the first six months of 2011, um, law enforcement at every level of the United States, state, federal, uh, local, anybody with a badge in America who made a request of Google for a suspect's internet account uh, uh, added up to about 11,000 users, which is 0.03% of all Google users. Um, and when we seek that information for the purpose of solving crimes, we have to get lawful process. There is a, a as I said at the outset, there's a check and balance. Um, it, it doesn't have to, war, probable cause is not the only legal standard that provides for meaningful judicial review. We have to get a court order in, in, in many cases uh, to get any kind of electronic information about your internet use or, or uh, cell phone use. And we do that through the check and balance that an independent judiciary provides. Um, the, in fact, your cell phone information, information about the location that's derived from your cell phone is already more protected than any of an array of information that you leave behind living on the grid as we all do in the ordinary course of your day. Um, most of the location information that you leave behind over the course of your travels today that don't involve the use of your cell phone, we can get with a subpoena. But with, if it relates to your cell phone, if it relates to your internet use, uh, a court order is required and there's, and there's uh, robust judicial review. The, to your, your question, I think, also raises one other issue, which is when we focus on privacy, when people talk about privacy, they always talk about privacy vis-a-vis -vis law enforcement, and they don't focus on the fact that, well, 0.03% of internet users have to worry about their accounts being accessed to, as part of a criminal investigation, 100% of cell phone and internet users need to worry about how providers are using their information. I suspect that, that the last panel was something of an eye-opener for many people, uh, uh, those here and those watching on, on the web, uh, uh, because most people are just unaware of how uh, the, the providers that they use, either for the phone or for, the, for their various internet applications, use and, and sell their information for commercial purposes. There is substantial uh, restriction on law enforcement's ability to, to access information in a criminal investigation. There is essentially no restriction legally on a provider's ability to use your information, uh, private information, location information for commercial purposes. And that's something that has to be part of the privacy discussion as well. Okay, can we let Greg respond as well? Sure. Well, let's not change the subject. I mean, yes, uh, there are commercial um, privacy challenges. We're here talking about law enforcement access to location information. Look, um, I think it's, it's your, your question was very telling because back in the day when um, Jerry Berman praised the intermediate level of um, scrutiny for this transactional information, there was a heck of a lot less of it. It would be very hard um, in 1986 to be able to anticipate the level of uh, intrusion that could be achieved through um, gathering up all kinds of transactional information, where you were at a particular moment, what you purchased, what, who your friends are, um, when you communicated with them, who you communicated with. Um, back in 86, you know, self, you know who had a cell phone? People, people who had cell phones in 86, they, were, they looked like bricks. There were maybe 100,000 of them max uh, available. They were not commonly 
being used. So today, we have all kinds of transactional records and um, the, a, a clear picture of a person's activities can be revealed through that transactional information. Uh, I think Justice Sotomayor was onto something when she said in Jones, I'm not sure that the third party records doctrine serves us well in the digital age, because I think that a lot of people wouldn't expect that the uh, government would not need a warrant when it is, for example, uh, uh, getting a, a list of every website a person visited in the last week or the last month or the last year. All right, do. Just one quick question. All right, we have time for one last question. Yeah. Ash Consultani, I was on the previous panel. Um, so consumers have the ability to swap their SIM cards or switch providers pretty quickly or put, in a, put their phone into airplane mode and uh, just use Wi-Fi. Um, do you know the prevalence and, and standard required to push software onto devices like CPAV that would uh, ping the ping law enforcement and notify law enforcement of a user's location simply for the devices that they can't get cell tower data on uh, easily? Um, I, I, I'm not familiar with, the, with that technology. I, um, and so I could, I could look into it and get back to you. I could just say generally that um, regardless of the technology being employed to get precision location information from a phone, uh, our, our practice is that you get probable cause, you get a search warrant to get uh, to, to get it to, to be able to, to get signals from the phone that will tell you its its precise location. Okay. All right. Thank you very much.